Let's get started. Um, we are in lecture six. We are rocking and rolling. Um, today, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to finish our discussion on support reactions, and then, um, dependent upon how the example goes in class today, we will bless you. Um, dependent upon how that example goes, we will um, uh, maybe uh, start a little bit of discussion on trusses, uh, which is our next unit. We're not going to get too far down the rabbit hole on that, um, but we will um, definitely uh, start uh, 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 sort of going into the trust uh, world next week. Um, a, a couple of uh, housekeeping items. So attendance is up to date. Um, I have graded homework 2.2, and if you check Blackboard right now, you will see that the solution is posted. Homework uh, 2.3 is due today, so how did concentrated moments go? So that pretty straightforward. I, I have a feeling that one was overall less tricky than 2.2 with all the inclinations and trig and all that. I think this one was a little uh, more straightforward. Homework 2.4 uh, is assigned today, and it is due on Wednesday because we don't have class on Monday because of Labor Day. Um, I did go onto Microsoft Teams and I posted a um, screenshot of that page of the textbook because I know that there's a couple of you uh, that might still be waiting on your textbooks. My hope is that by the time you come back from Labor Day weekend, everybody's textbooks should be in. So, uh, it's, uh, if, is anybody still waiting on their book? I'm just curious. Maybe not. Maybe we're all good. Um, so uh, maybe that'll be the last time I need I need to uh, uh, to do that. Um, before we uh, begin our discussion, um, I'm, I'm sure Elaine was sitting there like, is he going to do this? I did want to uh, take a second and mention our SAME ASC student chapter. Their first uh, meeting is going to be uh, at 5 uh, on Tuesday when we come back in this room. Uh, and I think this is one of those... There's pizza uh, type of events. So um, if you uh, have a chance to go, um, uh, you should. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of the ultimate events of the year, uh, which take place in April, are the uh, Virginia uh, Symposium, which has the Concrete Canoe and Steel Bridge Competition. Last year we hosted it, uh, and it went fantastic. Uh, this year it's going to be in Blacksburg, right? Um, and uh, uh, that I'm sure that... Uh, Elaine will be looking for folks to row and to weld uh, and, and grind and drill uh, for the bridge. But in all honesty, there's a lot more uh, that goes on with the chapter besides that. They have a lot of group social events and they have study groups and uh, work, uh, resume workshops uh, and whatnot and all sorts of uh, things that they do. Um, and there's their uh, QR codes. Um, I'll pull this up at the uh, end of class uh, again just to make sure everybody has it. Dr. But Yes? I'm going to send you a QR code that actually works. Oh. I'll, I'll put that on the team. Yeah. Tell you what, why don't you just send me a link and I'll put the link in the team's channel. Let's just do that. We'll make that easy. Or uh, um, you're on the team, just post it in the team. Okay. Yeah, just go ahead and post it in the team. That's fine. Um, so, okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right. So, um, so today, what we're uh, again, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss hinges. Um, and hinges does add a layer of, I don't like to use the term complexity because complexity implies difficulty and I don't, I, I really try and make the point that I don't really think anything that we do in this class is appreciably difficult, um, but I would say that hinges makes the problems a little longer um, because of just the fact that there's more unknowns and there's more analysis that we need to do. Now, again, up until now, we've handled quite a bit uh, in terms of computing support reactions. In terms of loads, we can handle concentrated loads, we can handle distributed loads, we can handle inclined loads, and now we can handle concentrated moments. And in terms of boundary conditions, now we've handled all three. We've got uh, pin boundary conditions, roller supports, uh, we've got fixed supports, we've got inclined rollers. You know, we've pretty much handled everything that there is to handle from a reaction computation standpoint. The one thing that we haven't discussed uh, is internal releases, and we're going to focus our discussion in terms of computing support reactions on hinges, um, because hinges are among the most common uh, release, both from a, a real-world standpoint and, and really even an analysis uh, standpoint. Um, there's really only like one place this entire semester where we handle a release 
that's not a moment release, and that's when we're drawing influence lines, and we sort of do it, and then we move on. Uh, but hinges we'll see uh, a little bit more frequently. Um, so again, um, analytically, from a mathematical modeling standpoint, an internal release or an internal hinge, moment release, um, is a point on the structure uh, for which we know what the internal uh, moment is. And when we're dealing with a hinge, we know that the internal moment is zero uh, at that particular point. Uh, and again, we've shown a couple of uh, real world examples, you know, this uh, pen and hanger connection or a con any connection that transmits shear but is not designed to transmit moment um, is uh, one that we would consider uh, an internal hinge. Uh, and then what we do uh, in terms of computing the um, uh, support reactions is we're going to recognize that um, when we look at uh, structures with internal hinges that more often than not there, there are too many unknowns looking at the structure externally than there are equations of equilibrium. And so we use the, uh, the, the secret weapon of structural engineering which is cutting a section. Uh, and so but, uh, specifically what I mean when, when I say we cut a section is we analytically split the structure in two. We split it into um, two independent free body diagrams and we recognize that when we cut the section uh, we're, we're again we're slicing the structure in half so internally at that point in question there must be an internal response necessary to keep the structure in equilibrium now when you cut a structure through an arbitrary point you know if it's a 2d structure you have at most three unknowns an unknown force in the x direction an unknown force in the y direction and an unknown moment but when you cut a section through a hinge you don't have a moment, or well, I guess you could say you do have a moment, but the moment is zero. You know what the moment is. So what you essentially can do is cut a section through a hinge, look at one free body diagram, and some moments about that hinge, uh, and then by doing that, that will give you that additional equation of equilibrium that you need uh, in order to solve the structure. Okay. Um, now, I'm going to throw this up here. I think I discussed this last time. This is our accepted sign convention for internal forces. And, and I'll be frank, it's not really going to matter for this component of the class. It's not going to matter for uh, computing uh, reactions for structures with internal hinges. But it is going to matter later. Okay? I mentioned last time that there's nothing really magic about these sign conventions. Like, as an example, if we look at positive shear forces, I've drawn positive shear forces uh, in this fashion. So if you cut a section and look to the left, we consider downward shears positive. And if you cut a section and look to the right, we consider upward shears positive. There, there is nothing inherently special about that. I mean, we could um, go in reverse if we wanted. But uh, the reason why we choose sign conventions in this fashion is because later on, when we start looking at plotting shear and moment diagrams, we're going to develop a pretty handy graphical technique for constructing shear and moment diagrams and it, it's it's really user friendly it's really easy to use but in order to utilize that graphical technique we have to adopt this sign convention so it's going to make our life a little easier and the same thing with bending moments this is the sign convention that we typically uh, adopt for positive bending moments because again it adheres to our uh, graphical technique that we're going to develop later it's just going to make our life a little easier so again, we could adopt another sign convention, but trust me, this is sort of the easiest one uh, that we're going to utilize. Um, so what I want to do is I want to focus on this example today. Um, and this example has quite a bit of the stuff that we've been uh, addressing up until now. We've got triangular loads, concentrated loads, point loads. We've got a lot of stuff going on with this example. Um, but we've also added the internal hinge. So I think the, um, the point I would make about this problem is that if, if we had started with this problem, I think this would have been a pretty um, tough road to navigate. But now, I mean, other than this internal hinge, everything here should be easy to understand. Okay, And then again, that's sort of the, the point with how we're going about this class. We're going to take each um, topic and just sort of ramp it up just a little bit. Okay, So what we've got here is we've got a, um, a two-span beam. So there's there's two spans between our external support. So we have support A, support B, and support C. Each span is 30 foot long, okay? Um, and what's, uh, what's different about this structure is this right here. So this is an internal hinge. So on my slides, I tend to represent an internal hinge with just a white circle there on the structure. So if you ever see that, 
Um, that's my way of, of representing an internal hinge. Um, most of the time, I will indicate it up here so you can see note the presence of a hinge between supports B and C. Um, but if for some reason I forget that, that's what that, um, that symbol means. Okay. So I've got a series of loads and I've got a series of reactions here. Let's just start this problem off by handling it the way that we've been handling our reaction problems up until now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to indicate my unknowns. Okay. So I have an unknown vertical reaction here, a vertical reaction here, and a vertical reaction here. Okay. We'll call this AY, BY, and CY. Then we have an unknown reaction right here, which we'll call AX. And we'll put our little tick mark through there to indicate that's a reaction. Now, now as we're copying this down, one thing I will point out, it is incredibly... Uh, a, a, a common error, I'll say, among uh, students who's first doing this is to put a reaction here and say that there's a reaction here. That's incorrect, okay? The hinge is not affixing the structure to the ground, okay? Support reactions are just that, reactions related to the supports, okay? And the only places that this structure is affixed to the ground is at points A, B, and C. So there is no external reaction uh, here at this hinge. Okay, the only external reactions are A Y B Y C Y uh, and this term here A X, which I think we can go ahead and before we go any further, I think we can handle A X right now. And what is A X? Zero. Okay, so we can sum forces in the X direction right now. We can say that A X is zero. Okay. Now, I went ahead and assumed all my reactions were upwards just to keep things easy. Spoiler alert, they actually do end up all being upwards uh, for this problem, uh, but they're not all the same, uh, obviously. Okay. Now, before we uh, start looking at, at uh, equations of equilibrium, the other thing I want to do is make sure I'm handling these distributed loads. So this uh, first distributed load near A, if I collapse that into a single point load, how much is that going to be? <coughs> 30, and how far from A? Seven and, a Seven and a half feet. Okay, everybody with me on that? All right, what about this triangular load? If I collapse that into a single point load, how much is that going to be? It's going to be 30, right? Because it's 4 times 15, which is 60, but it's a triangle. So 4 times fi uh, 15 over 2 is 2 times 15, and 2 times 15 is also 30. So this is going to be another 30 kip load. And located from B, how far away is that? Five foot. Five foot. There we go. Uh, and then finally, we have a distributed load right here. If I collapse that into a single point load, how much is that? Has everybody brought their Casio FX115 ES Plus or similar scientific calculator to class, right? Everybody did that. Everybody brought their calculator to class, right? I'm looking at all these people in their life. Don't look at me. 18. It's 18. Like, come on, Dr. Mike, it's Friday. We didn't think we needed our calculator. Engineer, y'all can do that. Okay, how far from C? 7.5 feet. Okay. All right. With me so far? Okay. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate how equations of equilibrium by themselves are not going to work, okay? All right, and so the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to start off by summing moments at A, okay? And, and what I'm doing is I'm going to try and attack this problem the way that I think that you would probably attack this problem before we have this discussion, okay? 
So let's just handle this like we would any reactions problem, and let's just sum moments at A and see what happens. Okay. Um, so we're going to sum moments at A. Okay, and let's just handle this again like we would any problem. Okay, so do we consider AX or AY? No. What about this 30 kip load? Do we consider that? 30 kips times a moment arm up. And that goes on the left side, right? All right. Same thing with this 14. So we have 30 times 7.5. And we have 14 times, what's that going to be? 15. Okay. What about this other 30 kips? What's that moment arm going to be? This one right here. 35 feet. And we got one more load. We have an 18 kips. What's that distance going to be? So we got 15, 30, 45, and 7 and a half. That's what? 52 and a half feet. Did I do that right? So we got a lot of load on this structure. Okay. But what am I missing? So let's see. Again, it's like a checklist. I handled this. I handled that. Handled this, 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 this. I didn't do my reactions. Didn't handle those. So I've got BY times 30. And CY times what? And both of those go on the right side, correct? Okay. So I've got BY times 30. And CY. CY times 60 feet. Okay. So... Let's do some math over here. Somebody uh, who has their Cassia, tell me what's that times that plus that times that, that times that, that times that. Sum that up. Tell me what you get on this side. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay, so 2,430 foot kips equals BY times 30 feet plus CY times 60 feet. So what's BY? Or what's CY? That's kind of a trick question. The answer is I don't know. Okay. I don't know what BY or CY is. All I know is that whatever BY is and whatever CY is, if I combine them in this fashion, I get 2430. So up until now, what we've been doing is applying an equation of equilibrium and getting an answer. We'll get, you know, AY is 52 kips or AX is zero or whatever, bless you. Um, but here we're not getting that. We're getting an expression, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, like, this is a valuable piece of information, it's just not a final answer, okay? So I'm going to circle this. And we'll call this equation, we'll call this equation one, okay? And let's just put it up here on the board in case I'm scrolling up and down. I want to make sure that this is in everybody's head, so equation one. So by times 30 feet plus CY times 60 feet is 24, 30 foot kips. Again, just a fact to keep in the back of our head, okay? And while we're at it, okay, let's just go ahead and do some of forces in the Y direction. Again, you know, I'm sort of thinking, okay, if you were doing this problem without this discussion, you would have done some moments and you wouldn't have got an answer. It's like, okay, uh, well, maybe we'll try some forces and see what happens there. So let's sum forces in the y direction. Okay. So I'm going to do that. Okay. So now let's sum forces in the y direction. So 
So look at this, what I've got. So what do I have going up? I've got A, Y, B, Y, and C, Y. So A, Y, B, Y, C, Y. And what do I have going down? Okay, so I've got 30, 14, 30, 18. Okay, so 30, 14, 30, 18. So now I've got AY plus BY plus CY equals, see if I can do that in my head. So 14 and 18, that's 32, and 60 gives me 92. Did I do that right? So I'd argue this one helps me out even less, right? I'm even, uh, I'm even less, even less. Okay. So but it is a fact. It is a, a, a useful fact maybe for later. So we'll call this equation two. Let's put this up here. So AY plus BY plus CY plus 92 kips. Okay. All right. And again, th these equations didn't just appear out of nowhere. Okay. I got this expression by summing moments, and I got this expression by summing forces in the y direction. Okay, so that's where they came from. So, now what? Okay, now what do we do? Because uh, we don't have an answer. Like, we're, we're not done because we don't have an answer. We don't know what A, Y, B, Y, or C, Y is. Okay, and again, what's the answer? We go back to that secret weapon of structural engineering, our samurai sword or lightsaber, and we cut a section, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my samurai sword or lightsaber and I'm going to cut through the hinge. Okay. So up here on the three body diagram, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this dashed line through the hinge. And again, that's where I'm going to cut the section or the structure in two. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call that section one one. Okay. So like if, if remember in CAD, you'll have like cross section like AA or BB or 11. So we'll call that section 11. Sometimes we have to cut multiple sections on a problem. So we might have a section 11 and a section 22. Um, but we'll just call it section 11 for our discussions. Now, I'll, I'll give you one tenet of structural analysis, which I genuinely think has some advantages. So I'll level with you. I'm kind of lazy when it comes to doing structural analysis problems. And what I mean by that is I would rather assess the problem as easy as possible with as few hits on the calculator as possible because it tends to reduce error and it makes the problem go by faster. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Okay, so I'm taking my samurai sword or lightsaber and I'm going to split that structure in two right through that hinge. So I'm going to have a an entirely new structure on the left and an entirely new structure on the right. If I were to perform analysis, which, which chunk of the structure do you think is going to be easier to deal with? The chunk on the left or the chunk on the right? The chunk on the right. The chunk on the right. There's a lot less going on. I've got two unknown reactions here. I've only got one unknown reaction here. And I've got all these different loads that I can ignore. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here and I'm going to say um, cut a section at the hinge and what I'm going to say is I'm going to look to I'm going to look to the right okay now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this structure, okay, and, and the best way of imagining it is imagine literally taking the structure and covering up everything over here, and I'm just going to redraw all of that. So what does that look like? Sorry for all the scrolling. I'm trying to avoid as much scrolling as I can. Okay. 
So here's the beam. Let's make that a little lower. So here's the beam. Okay. There's a roller over here. And there's a vertical reaction at that roller. We'll call that CY. Okay. Now, on the structure, there is a distributed load over here. About like that. And we have this distributed load acting downward. And that distributed load was 1.2 kips per foot. And then we've got this, that's where we cut the section right there. So that's section 1-1. One, one. That's where we samurai sorted through the, through, the, um, through the beam. And this dimension right here is 15 feet. Okay? Now, just like before, we took that and we collapsed that into a single point load. That was 18 kips, and this dimension right here, remind me, was what? 7.5 feet. Okay. Now, so far so good, but remember we cut through a hinge. Okay. Now, if you cut through a hinge, what you're going to develop is an unknown force in the x direction. So we'll just call that f of x, and it doesn't really matter, again, I'm, so I'm going to draw this according to positive sign convention. It doesn't really matter right now if you get the directions right or not, because you'll, you'll see why here in a bit. Okay, I've got an unknown force in the x direction. I have an unknown force in the y direction. But do I have an unknown moment? No. Why don't I have a moment? Because I cut through a hinge, okay? If I were to cut the structure here, or here, or here, then I would have uh, an unknown moment. But because I cut through the hinge, I know that the moment there is zero, okay? In fact, that is going to be the fact that I use to solve for that reaction CY. I propose that the sum of the moments through the hinge, oops, through the hinge, equals zero. And the way I'm going to write that is the sum of the moments through the hinge. And I'm going to put a little error there to say I'm looking to the right. Okay? So what we'll do is we'll draw ourselves a little moment table. So what do I have going on? So what I'm doing is I'm summing moments right here. Okay? So this is the point about which I'm summing moments. So tell me what to do. You tell me. How do I handle this 18 kips? Does it generate moment at the hinge? Yes. Uh, left side of the table, right side of the table? Left side. Times a moment arm up? There we go. All right, so we have 18 kips. Okay. And that must be balanced by the moment generated by CY at a moment arm up? 15. 15 feet. So 15 feet. CY times 15 feet. So we have 18 times 7.5, which is 135. And CY is what? Okay. Okay. So we're getting somewhere. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Let's circle that in green. So if we're looking at the problem as a whole, so here's the problem as a whole. We're trying to solve for the following four reactions, AX, AY, BY, and CY. Okay, so before we started doing all this stuff up here, we knew that AX was zero. And now we know that this is 9 kips upwards, right? So this box, that, that's our goal. Okay, so we're trying to do this. Okay.
So now we've got one of them. We've got two more left. Okay? So tell me what do we do? Go back to equation one, plug in C1. Exactly right. So if we go to equation one, we know that by uh, times 30 plus cy times 60 equals 2430. When we solved this, we didn't have an answer. right? We didn't know what was going on. We just knew that whatever by was and whatever cy was, when we combined them in this fashion, we got 2430. Well, now we know what cy is. So now let's go back to equation one. So... So by so by so we'll say positive because again we assumed them all upwards. So one question I always get about signs. So when we wrote this equation, this was assuming all the reactions were upwards. So if for some reason this was negative, I would just plug in a negative number. So, so by times 30 feet plus okay, 90 times 60 is 540. By times 30 is... Um, is what is that? So that's 1890. 1890. So therefore, BY is positive. What? What is that? 63. 63 kips. Okay. There's an answer. And remember, this is our goal. Okay? So now we're getting somewhere. So this is 63 kips up. So how do we solve for AY? Equation two. We know that combining all those vertical reactions has got to be 92 kips. So back to equation two. BY was 63 kips. Again, positive number because we've got a positive answer. This is 9 kips. 63 and 9 is 72. I can do that one. So to summarize, here's our reactions. AX is zero, AY is 20 kips up, BY is 63 kips up, CY, nine kips up. And just for posterity. Right, let's take a step back, see what you all think. Does anybody have any questions on this? So one thing I'll say is, so now that you've done this problem, so once you start getting a little bit more experience with this, what I would probably do from a, from a strategy standpoint is I would probably cut the section first before I sum forces in the y direction for the whole structure and then some moments about some point for the whole structure. I would probably cut the section first because that would give me CY first. Then I could sum moments at A because like what I did is I summed moments at A, got an equation, and then I had to like do some work and then plug back into the equation. Well, if I did that work first, I would it would reduce the amount of steps, right? But what I'm doing is trying to 
uh, approach, or like, wait a minute, how would you have done it, and then, then add on to it. I'm fine with either way. Um, again, whatever is more comfortable. The more practice you'll get, you'll, you'll figure out uh, which method works for you. Um, any questions? Okay. All right. So um, I'm, I'm going to discuss a little bit about trusses, but we're not going to get into our trust problem today. Uh, and then I'll, um, we'll end a, a little bit early today. Um, but I want to just sort of introduce that. The only other point I wanted to mention, though, on uh, this, on the homework, if we go to the um, assignment. So one thing I did is um, I made a comment that um, just make sure when you're cutting a section you look to the left. Okay, I'm having you do that so that everybody's doing the problem the same way. Essentially, that was my main reason for doing that. Um, and assume all your reactions uh, initially act upwards. Okay, sound good? Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about our next unit, which is trusses. Um, and and what my main reason for doing this is that whenever we're doing a problem in class, sometimes it just takes a while with trusses. Um, once you get the hang of trusses, I would say that um, one of the, the downsides from, a, from an enjoyment perspective is that trusses can be maybe a little dull or a little repetitive because you're kind of doing the same thing over and over again. But if you get to the point where the problem is boring you, from a, from a teacher's perspective, I kind of think that's a good thing because that means you understand it. <laughs> you know, um, If you understand it and it's just the same thing over and over again, then that's kind of what I want. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about just trusses in general and their behavior. Um, we're going to spend the most of our time, uh, the, mo the bulk of our time with trusses discussing the method of joints. Okay? So if you remember from statics, there are two methods um, that you can use to analyze a truss, and that's the method of joints and the method of sections. And in statics, we give this a very quick cursory review, whereas in here we're going to get a little bit more in depth. But if I had to pick between the two, which one do I believe is important for you as an engineer to develop a skill on, I would say it's the method of joints because of the difference in the, um, the goals with the, the processes. But we'll get to that uh, uh, here in a bit. Let's take our time with it. Um, so let's first off talk about structures or talk about trusses and, and what they're used for. Um, so let's let's get into the real world a little bit. So what is a truss? It's a arrangement of, uh, of straight members uh, that are typically in a triangular pattern to form either a structure or a component of a structure. So what I mean by that is if we're talking about this bridge here on the right, that's the whole structure. That's the, the truss is the structure. Whereas in building design, a truss might not be the entire structure, it might be the roof of the, the, the structure, okay? Um, what is the advantage, disadvantage uh, of using trusses, okay? Well, uh, I want to get a little bit real world on this. Um, so what's the advantage of a truss over other structural types like beams and frames and things like that? Um, for number one, trusses are very lightweight of the... Um, types of structural systems that we commonly use. Trusses are not only the most lightweight, but they are also uh, typically the most stiff, okay? Um, what stiff, and, and so I'm going to throw some terms stiffness and strength, and they sound like the same, uh, 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 they mean the same thing, but they don't in a structural engineering context. Um, a stiff structure is one that deflects very little under uh, application of load. So that's sort of the difference between stiffness and flexibility. So if a structure deforms a lot under load, we call that a flexible structure. We don't really like flexible structures. We would like structures to be stiff. Um, and trusses, pound for pound, are among the stiffest uh, 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 structural uh, arrangement that you can find. Strength is a different term. Strength is if I have an element and I apply a load, how much load until it fails, until it no longer performs its design function. So those are, those are uh, distinct, uh, uh, different terms in the land of structural engineering. So uh, 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 trusses are lightweight, and because they're lightweight and stiff, trusses do a pretty good job of, of handling really, really long spans. So if you have a really short bridge, as an example, you're probably not going to go with a truss. You'll probably go with just a, a beam-type structure. Now, what are the disadvantages of trusses? Can anybody think of a disadvantage of a truss? Like why you wouldn't want to use a truss? Yes, fracture critical. Oh, oh, you're you spent some time at a, it, uh, as an inspector. Uh, did, did you where did you do any inspection over the summer? Yeah, like twenty bridges. That, that'll do it. Yeah. So trusses, and, and so you're getting into that is. Uh, oh man, I can talk about that all day. 
So trusses are considered fracture critical, um, and, and I, I could talk about that all day, but essentially what a fracture critical system is, is it is perceived, to, whenever you have a fracture critical system, the idea is that if one member fails, that the entire structure or a, a component of that structure might be subject to collapse. So like if this member fails, the whole bridge might, might uh, come down. And any fracture critical structure has more stringent inspection requirements. Um, that's not to say that we won't use it. Sometimes if you have, I mean, if you have a bridge that's 600 feet long, you might have to go with a truss because it's the only system that'll feasibly work. Um, but yes, that is, that is a, uh, uh, that is a disadvantage, don't get me wrong. What's another disadvantage of trusses, do you think? They're expensive. They're expensive. That's probably one of the biggest disadvantages that you would find in both buildings and bridges is that they're expensive because um, you have multiple members that have to be fabricated. Each of those members have holes that need to be drilled. You have things that have, need to be welded. You have gusset plates. It takes a oodles of time in the field to assemble. So trusses are expensive. Um, Again, given your span arrangement, they might, you just, that might be the only uh, solution that works. I mean, if you go into a um, large convention center and you look at the roof, you'll see these big truss elements that are used to support the roof. Because guess what? It's a football stadium and you need a really, really big uh, 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 flexural element to uh, support the, the roof. We don't want columns in the middle of the football field, right? So they end up using trusses. It, it is what it is. So it just depends on the... Uh, the nature of what you're looking at. Okay. Um, now, what we're interested in uh, as structural engineers is analysis and design. We want to be able to quantify the forces inside those truss elements uh, from an analysis standpoint so that we can size those members from a design standpoint. So we're in structural analysis, so let's talk about analysis. Okay. So when we analyze trusses, we make a few assumptions. Um, and uh, I, mean, we, uh, I know that I talk about this when, we, uh, when I teach Engineering 213, but it's probably been a while since you had static. So uh, let's just sort of recap these uh, uh, assumptions. So the first thing that we assume is that all of the members are connected by frictionless joints. Okay? Um, and what we're getting at with that assumption is, number one, so we're sort of assuming that each one of these points is sort of acting like a hinge. Um, but we're also uh, assuming, when we say frictionless, what we're saying is that whatever the, uh, 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 the forces that we apply, when we resolve those forces uh, in a method of joints or method of sections analysis, we don't have to consider any additional unintended impacts from friction or, or anything like that. Um, second uh, assumption that we make is that all the loads, all the support reactions are applied directly at the joints. No loads applied on the members. If there's any load in a truss system, we assume that it is applied just to the joints. Um, and the third is that at the joints, if we look at each of the members, the neutral axes, or where the centroids are, the centroidal axes, they all coincide. They all meet at a common point. And that's very easy to accommodate. We do that in the real world. Here's an image of a truss joint. This is a gusset plate. And we've got one, two, three, four, five members. If we were to draw where the centroid is of each one of these members, they all coincide at a given point. And we do that to uh, eliminate as much potential bending in those members as possible. Because what we're trying to get at when we make these three assumptions is that inside a truss member, because we fabricated it a certain way, because we're resolving these assumptions uh, in a certain fashion, we do that such that when we analyze a, a truss, we say, okay, for an arbitrary structure, we might have axial forces, shears, and moments, but in a truss, all we have is axial forces. And that's what those assumptions are intended to do. So if you cut a section through an arbitrary point in an arbitrary structure, you might have three unknowns. But for a truss, we consider we only have one. Now that unknown might either be a tensile uh, force or it might be a compressive force. Um, so the arrows might be pointing this way or that way. But the point is, is that the only forces that we have are along the axis uh, of the member. Okay? And that's, that's what those assumptions are intended to do. And I can tell you, and, I, and, I would, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to bring these up, I've actually done field tests of truss bridges 
and run trucks over the bridge and monitor the, the compression members, monitor the tension members, and look at the forces, and they were all carrying pretty much compression or tension. So these assumptions uh, bear out even uh, in the real world. Now, when we analyze a truss, um, we have sort of two methods. So when I say analyze a truss, let's take a step back. So we've been doing structural analysis this whole time, but our structural analysis has been focused on external forces, so the reactions necessary to keep the structure as a whole in equilibrium. Now we're starting to look at the internal forces inside the structure. So right now we're talking about trusses, so we're talking about, if we look at this truss up here, what's the internal force inside this member? What about this member or this member? We want to know the forces inside each of those members because that's going to tell us how to size those members, and that's the, the land of design. Now we've got two ways of doing that. The first is the method of joints. It is more tedious. Uh, it takes a lot longer, but um, uh, it's thorough. Okay. The thing about the method of joints is that if you apply the method of joints to a truss, you will get the force in every member, every member. Okay. And that's why I tend to focus on that more heavily in this class because. For the most part, that's what you all want. If you're interested in designing the structure, you need forces in all the members, right? Um, the method of sections um, is good for determining forces in a few members, okay? So I, I cover the method of sections more so as a footnote, okay? I think that there are two um, practical applications of the method of sections. The first is as a gut check. If you're doing the method of joints and there's some forces that don't quite make sense, you can say, hey, I'm going to take a step back, cut a section, and see if I'm getting the same answer. So it can serve as a check, but the other, I'll be honest, is the FE exam. Okay? You're going to get some trust, and it's going to say, what's the force in that member? The method of sections can be faster if you're trying, if you've got this big trust and you just want the force in this one member. If you did the method of joints, it would take a while to apply the method of joints through until you got to that, that one member. Uh, but method of joints, uh, from a practical perspective, is what we're interested in. Now, whenever we do the, uh, or whenever we apply the method of joints, we have to look at our joints and go back to our assumptions. And if you remember, we assumed frictionless joints. We assumed that all the loads were at the joints, and we assumed that all the centroids of the members coincided. So what we have is a concurrent force system. If you remember from statics. The first topic that you learn is statics of particles, remember? It's when all the forces all meet at a common point, right? And for those systems, there is no moment, okay? Moment does not exist in a concurrent force system, okay? So as a result, we do not, we are not able to apply the sum of moments to a joint because all the forces are all meeting at a common point. So what does that mean from an analysis perspective? For a 2D joint, all the joint has to satisfy is that the sum of forces in the x direction equals zero and the sum of forces in the y direction equals zero. So there, there's a lot less to maintain. But what can make a method of joints a little more tedious is that because we only have two equations of equilibrium, we can only solve joints that have at most two unknowns. So like if I go back to this truss and I say, I'm going to start my truss analysis by looking at joint I. Well, joint I has five unknowns. I can't start there. I have to start at like joint F or joint L and then work my way across the structure. Because if I start with joint F, I can solve this member and this member, and then I can go to joint G, because joint G will have this unknown and this unknown. This one won't be an unknown because I'll have already solved it. So you have to work your way uh, across the structure. So what we'll do when we come back from, uh, from our long weekend is we will look at this truss, okay, and we will apply the method of joints. Now, the only thing I want to um, mention as a footnote before we move on is that it's going to start to be pretty common that I will have examples that look like this. What is something that's kind of noteworthy on the slide that I haven't put on here before? The reactions. I solved the reactions for you. At this point, I think we're good, right? I hope, right? At this point, um, I, I mean, we've done, we, we've sort of, we had four solid lectures on reactions, right? So I've got to believe that, you know, okay, like for example, we look at the structure, there's 15 kips to the right, so there's 15 kips to the left, okay? So I'm giving you the support reactions. Unless 
The solution of support reactions is integral to understanding the topic. I will probably just give you the reactions on a lot of these problems because I want to get to the good stuff. I want to get to the trust analysis. Okay? So I just want to mention that as a footnote because you will see that. All right. Any questions? All right. We will probably jump right to this when we come back from break. I know I uh, blathered on a little bit. My apologies. But no class on Monday. So that's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday. You all have a wonderful weekend.